Methylene blue. Wow, everybody's talking about it. It sounds great, and then it also sounds really scary. And there seems to be a lot of confusion online, which of course there always is with almost anything. And so what could methylene blue do for you? What could be some potential up and downsides, etc.? Going back to my colleagues, you know, notion that, well, it, I know it's a medicine, an emergency medicine, but it's mostly used as a dye. So why are we even giving this to people if they're not having an emergency? As with all things in life, two opposing things can be true at the same time. And I think it's really important to know why you can have two things that seem to be opposing that are true at the same time, why that goes on, and what would that lead to in regard to my outcome as far as medically using it and also my safety as far as medically using it. So the first thing that I think is good to keep in mind is it is the oldest, it's considered to be the oldest synthetic medication that we know about methylene blue, which, yeah, that's pretty cool. Now, is it the oldest medicine that we know about? No, because there's non-synthetic medicines that are, say, plant extracts or physical treatments like heat and stuff like that. Those are even older. But as a synthetic drug, methylene blue actually is the oldest one in most textbooks. It's recognized that nobody, no human, really no animal, should be taking the kind of methylene blue that's used in industry as a dye. You can get that really easily, but you should not take that for a number of reasons that we'll talk about. And just like any other thing, but methylene blue is sort of unique in that it has like a giant use in industry for non-medical reasons, and that it has specific, like uber-specific medical uses. They are the same name, but their purity is different. This is part of the reason why we can have two things being true at the same time, which is very important to keep in mind. So before we get into the difference between the the medical drug type of methylene blue, and then the industrial or laboratory industrial part of methylene blue. Why are they different? Let's talk about the mechanisms behind what would appropriate methylene blue do once it goes into a human that might be helpful for the health and well-being and wellness of that human beyond the emergency uses that we know about. And this is probably the main reason that it gets a lot of play, you know, on the internet, etc., is it's considered an alternate energy source for your mitochondria. Now we know that the mitochondria make the energy in our cell. We often call it the powerhouse of the cell, right? Well, we have many mitochondria inside our cells. And so they sometimes slow down when we have fatigue and we're recovering from illness and all, all manner of things. And then we our, our body slows down, right? Methylene blue is not a normal thing used by the body like, you know, NAD would be or other stuff. It's an accessory thing. And it goes kind of, you can think of it going in the side of the energy producing complexes and turning them on, making them go faster. So it is a supplemental energy trigger for your mitochondria. Now that's, that's good. If you don't have anything else to run your mitochondria and, and, and they're sick and you make them go faster with methylene blue, you might feel kind of sick from that. It's not dangerous. It just, you're running a system. It's not working very well, but that's what it does at your mitochondria. It goes in through the side and turns turns on the energy producing pathway, essentially. The other thing is, is that it is a redox molecule. So there is a blue version, and then there is a clear version, and they're both methylene blue, but one is oxidized and one is reduced. And so in your body, and this is uh, something another doctor was asking me about that confused them, was one day they take the same dose of methylene blue and you see it in your urine as a color because it is a dye, right? Well, on one day, the you know, and usually your urine's kind of a greenish blue hue to it. One day it'll be more greenish blue and the next day, same dose urine is normal color. And they're like, that doesn't make any sense to me because the same dose went into me, but my urine was two different colors on two different days. Well, it's because a redox molecule encounters the rest of your body's trillions of cells and all of the oxidative reductive, this is related to antioxidants and stuff, all the oxidative reductive capacity. And so if it's filtering through your body today and it goes into one side, either the oxidative or reductive side, on that day, you're going to have more color because remember one side is, has more color, the other side is clear. If it, on the other day, it goes to the other side of your redox and there's more of that going on, it's going to come out and you're not going to have any color to it. And does that mean anything? Not really, because it's just 
your, your body does a zillion incalculable number of redox processes every day. And so it's a wild card as to what going in and coming out, it's going to look like in the redox world, but also it helps with oxidation reduction, which can help with cell stability and other stuff like that. Now, traditional uses beyond emergency medicine and emergency medicine, it's given at fairly high dose for a problem called methemoglobinemia, where you have a form of hemoglobin. So your blood looks normal, but the hemoglobin will not let go of the oxygen. And so you've got normal hemoglobin, but your oxygen starved, which usually doesn't happen. But if you get methemoglobin, that is, it, it looks like hemoglobin. It just hold your oxygen and will not let it go. You give methylene blue at higher doses intravenously, and that will go in and it will change the binding status of the meth hemoglobin and allow you to get oxygen to your tissues. So that's, that's its use in emergency medicine primarily. But it's also used in surgery. It's used in surgery as a dye, as a tracer to find things because you're, let's say you're looking, you know, for a potential leak in a blood vessel or you're uh, suturing together, you know, anastomosis and you want to see if things are leaking or in certain, a little bit more rare, but certain types of uh, procedures procedures in ophthalmology, it might be used as a backup dye. There's other dyes they prefer nowadays, but might be used that way. So it's used, again, in surgeries and stuff. It's also sometimes used in neurological surgeries, when cutting in your brain or fixing your brain, to help with, again, supporting and protecting the cells from the trauma of surgery. That's another sort of side benefit to be used for. Other things that it has been shown in research to do, one is to change the tau protein proteins that can disrupt certain parts of the brain and memory function and other stuff. So it actually shifts them back more towards normal. It also is involved in DNA protection and repair. A lot of new research on this, looking at undoing chemotherapy-induced DNA breakages and helping parts of your body that we don't want to have broken DNA in, like our kidneys, which are heavily bothered by a lot of the traditional uh, chemotherapies. Methylene blue is being looked at to undo DNA damage and breakage. Very, very important there. And the other thing is it's used a lot in anti-infective immune supportive situations as a photoactive agent. So it photobiomodulates or is activated by red light at 660 nanometers, so 660 red light. And if you put 660 red light, say in a tissue bed or in the blood and the methylene blue goes through, it becomes, remember it's a redox molecule, it becomes bioactivated, it's more likely to kill infectious material that way as well. So it really does a whole bunch of things that we often don't think of. We may have heard of it for emergency medicine. We might have heard it for, you know, things like energy and stuff like that, but we probably hadn't thought about it for all of these other things. And there's even more research that we can you know, get into in the summary. So kind of to summarize the mechanisms, we definitely have uses in emergency medicine and surgery. We definitely have uses in the res restoration of energy. So chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, long COVID, recovery from surgery, recovery from anything. It can be helpful with energy restoration. As we said, DNA protection and repair. So the research, a lot of it's about chemotherapy, but also I've used it with people who've had to take other drugs that are DNA damaging as a protective measure around the DNA damaging drug because you generally want the benefit of the drug without killing, you know, and harming the DNA inside your patient. A big area of study is in central nervous system balance in memory, memory recovery, memory maintenance, very, very useful there. And as we mentioned, with phototherapy, help with infections, it uh, actually, because of some of its uses, can be helpful in certain types of infectious agents all on its own. But when you combine it with 660 nanometer red light, it actually is more active with infectious agents. So those are all the good things. So as I'm having this conversation with my colleague, and it's like, well, yeah, there's a big industrial use of methylene blue, and there's an industrial laboratory use, which which is quasi-medical, but then there's the medical use. So what is the difference? 
It's all methylene blue. The difference is in the application parameters, so safety parameters, because it is a drug, and then in the purity of the methylene blue. So what does that mean? Well, when we talk about the application parameters, if we're giving high doses, we generally screen for a genetic enzyme deficiency called G6PD, because if we have an enzyme deficiency there and then we give a whole bunch of methylene blue, we could create a hemolytic crisis, which is something that you really don't want. So if it's done at high dose, we generally are screening for this enzyme deficiency. One that becomes more commonly a problem is it has some crossover in the serotonin system, and we use serotonin drugs for lots of stuff, but serotonin drugs like SSRIs and SNRIs that we might use for depression or maybe anxiety or something, those can be contraindicated indicated with methylene blue because they both are going to uh, collide at a particular part of the pathways that they both are trying to go through. Another category of antidepressant that methylene blue can be a problem with is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor because it also can be a monoamine oxidase inhibitor as well. And just like with G6PD, the serotonin drugs, monoamine oxidase drugs are dose dependent, but you would never take methylene blue and a serotonin drug drug or a monamine oxidase inhibiting drug without having a healthcare provider who really knows what they're doing with both types of drugs managing that. It would never, never take, if you're on an SSRI, SNRI, other serotonin drugs, monamine oxidase inhibitor, don't ever take that with methylene blue. That's it. They don't go together. And then the other thing is the, when we're thinking about parameters, dosing parameters, people like all things are, have wildly different responses to methylene blue dose wise. Because it goes in and it creates more energy in your mitochondria, often aside from greenish blue urine, the first thing that you might notice is going to be more energy. Well, that's great if I'm tired, but what if I get too much energy? It's going to feel like you're over caffeinated or a lot over caffeinated. And so I always tell patients, look, we're going to start low and work up. But if you hit a dose where you start feeling shaky or your heart is racing or you feel like you literally drank a pot of coffee or something, stop and let's talk about the dose because that means you got too much. And that can happen at a few milligrams for some people and it can happen at 50 or 100 milligrams for some people. So it's very individualized and this is why you need to start low and work your way up and know what your tolerance is. So those are the administration and management parameters. But the other parameters that goes back to my colleague's big conundrum about big industrial use, small medical use. Why is everyone else taking methylene blue for non-emergency purposes? This gets to safety. Now, safety we talked about with regard to other drugs and other stuff like that. But the big thing is that you want to have a methylene blue source that has passed quality control specifically for heavy metal toxin levels in the methylene blue. The drug source that we would use in the emergency room has to go through that before they make it in a sterile product so that we can give it intravenously, right? I have talked to pharmacies that manufacture methylene blue for non-sterile and sterile use. And even with United States Pharmacopeia grade, so USP grade, usually they buy a kilo at a time of methylene blue powder. They will test it and they have to send it off to a third-party lab for heavy metal testing. And out of three kilos of methylene blue, only one kilo will pass heavy metal levels. And that's already at pharmacy grade. So if you go out and you just go online and you don't know who the supplier is, even if they say it's USP grade, which half the time it's not, that's a whole other story, unless you can see a quality control testing by third party that says we did test it for heavy metals and it passed QC, you know, low enough or zero heavy metals, you don't know that you're not taking a product that is both giving you methylene blue and toxins at the same time. So it is a drug. It's regulated as a drug, but it's also diverted and sold as a supplement. So if you're buying it as a supplement, please make sure that whoever you're buying it from has quality control that they will share with you that it has passed a heavy metal toxin assessment. Because the last thing you want to do is take methylene blue to help you and then take a heavy metal that's a mitochondrial poison on top of it. That's not going to work out well together. And if the pharmacies that are making sterile product have to go through th three kilos before they get one kilo to pass heavy metal,
metal testing, imagine what the non-pharmacy production is doing as well. So just buyer beware, look for quality control, and please be safe because you don't want to be using lab industrial grade or dye grade or any other grade that has not, not just USP for pharmacy, but past heavy metal screening as well. All right, let's hope that answers those questions. I really had a lot of fun putting this one together. I'm Dr. A. Thank you for listening. Thank you, all you subscribers. Thanks for sharing us with your friends for patient education resources. Please do subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Share, comment, like, do all the stuff. I will see you all on the next video. And you can check out our Methylene Blue content over on the main YouTube page as well.